Well, it's it's Dr. Hudson. Why don't we go ahead and get started? It's it's a great pleasure to uh, not to see you. I can't see you, but I know you're there, and I'm proud to be with you today as we talk about uh, some of our journey and some of our innovation uh, in uh, how we're leading the way with battling COVID-19. I will say that uh, I, I never dreamed when I got that first notice um, about a, a new pneumonia-like illness coming from Wuhan, China to where we are today and the evolution that we've seen in combating COVID-19, not only across the organization, but across the nation. I've been exceedingly proud that Swedish has been at the forefront of a lot of that innovation and technology and partnered with other healthcare organizations locally and nationally in research and other things that have been at the forefront of combating COVID-19. I wanna make sure that I, I'm exceedingly thankful uh, to a lot of you uh, as donors, uh, as uh, the philanthropic efforts uh, that you've contributed to have helped us lead the way, but also make it possible with a lot of things that we're able to do uh, in this arena. As you know, we are in the midst of, uh, of the Delta variant. Um, it is taking a significant toll, just uh, not only on our workforce, our clinicians, our nurses, but also on our communities. Uh, and uh, this is one of those times where we're all stepping up together and helping one another get through this. Um, I, I will say that uh, the morale is, is, it's not outstanding, but it's reasonable at times like this. And I think this is one of those times where we've all pull, pulled together, turned to one another uh, for strength, uh, camaraderie, assistance, and most importantly, love uh, as, we, as we go through this. Um, the, the latest buzz on the street is looking at President Biden's plan. He's released a six-pronged comprehensive national strategy for COVID-19, which in, initially looks at requiring uh, vaccinations for over 17 million healthcare workers across the United States um, that are participating hospitals with Medicare and Medicaid uh, services. So that just came on the news wire. I got that about 15 minutes ago and we're, we're still deciphering what that looks like in, in uh, correspondence with, uh, of course, Governor Inslee's mandate of vaccinations uh, that goes live for us on October 18th. So, um, through all of this, I, I will say that, you know, that I'm giving you that information just to let you know this seems to be changing by the hour. <laughs> and I know that um, Christy Carrington, our chief nursing officer, and Chris Dale, our chief medical officer, have some great uh, news and, and uh, the latest and greatest of what we're doing in COVID-19. But again, as I turn it back over to Mona, I would say that we can't do all of this without your participation, your guidance, your support. Uh, and for that, I'm greatly, greatly appreciative on behalf of Swedish. So on this note, I'll turn it over to Mona and we will uh, continue forth with our program. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Hudson. And good afternoon, everyone. As Dr. Hudson mentioned, I'm Mona Lee Locke and I'm thrilled to be celebrating my second year anniversary here at Swedish next week. So essentially my entire career in healthcare here has been centered around COVID. What a wild journey it has been. I'm happy to be here today with you and look forward to an interesting and educational conversation with our experts. This program is sponsored by the Swedish Foundation and the foundation is the fundraising arm of Swedish, which is the largest nonprofit healthcare system in Washington state based in Seattle. So I would like to take the opportunity again, again to thank many of you, our donors who are joining us today. Without your support, we can't continue the innovative work we do each day for our patients. In regard to how our time will be spent today, we'll have some introductory remarks from our panelists, but this event is really meant to be informative and interactive, so please enter your questions in our Q&A. We will answer your questions and some that we collected in advance throughout the call today and at the very end. Also, there's an option that when you're entering into the questions in the Q&A to mark them anonymous, if you prefer. Um, just a reminder, this video is being recorded and it will be shared. And at this point, I'm thrilled to introduce you to Christy Carrington, our Regional Chief Nursing Officer at Swedish Health Services, and Dr. Chris Dale, our Chief Medical Officer of Swedish Acute Services. Christy and Dr. Dale, thank you for joining us. Please tell us about your roles at Swedish and would it be possible for each of you to share like one takeaway that you would carry forward from COVID-19? 
Certainly. Well, thank you, Mona. And um, it's so great to be here with all of you. My name is Christy Carrington. I'm the Regional Chief Nursing Officer for Swedish. Um, I have been with Swedish um, actually close to six years now, almost at my six month, or excuse me, my six year anniversary. Um, and I have to say, um, I, I think Mona, to answer your question, what was my key takeaway? I mean, this has been a long journey we've been on, um, 18 months. Um, and I know we said this early on, but I think this has stuck with me is never let a crisis go to waste. Um, I think, you know, whether it be in our professional lives or our personal lives, navigating through a crisis can bring some of the, some of the most valuable learnings that we can get in life. Um, I have to say that throughout this pandemic, we as a health system, we've learned to flex and innovate at such a rapid pace, simply out of need. And I think what it's done, it's really tested our boundaries, but it's also proven to us what we're capable of. I like that. that that's a good thing. Um, yeah, so I, I am uh, Chris Dale. I'm a pulmonary and critical care doc here at Swedish. I've been at Swedish for about a decade or so, uh, and I'm privileged to serve alongside uh, Christy and, and Kevin Brooks, who's uh, unable to be with us today as the triad over acute care. Um, yeah, and what have we learned from COVID? Um, you know, two things, I guess, popped to the front of my mind there. Um, one is uh, just the value of teamwork. Um, you know, Swedish is a, is a big place. Um, you know, we care for, as, as Mona said, you know, you know, a million patients roughly. Like a lot, of, a lot of people come to Swedish or trust Swedish with their care. And it requires a, a large number of people in order to provide that care. And so um, we need to help support the caregivers in terms of being able to provide the best care possible. And it takes a whole village of people in order to make it happen. So that's the first is, is teamwork and supporting one another because this doesn't work without, um, without a good team. Uh, and then the second, actually, uh, about a month ago, I guess it was, uh, I saw The Martian. I'd never seen it before. And it's a movie with Matt Damon where he kind of is on like uh, Mars and uh, he crash lands there and has to figure out how to get off, uh, get off of Mars. And basically one of the phrases that from that movie is uh, work the problem. And he just goes and whenever he's confronted with an obstacle, he figures out how to how to overcome it. And I feel like that's been the journey um, in terms of COVID is, um, you know, when we're confronted with an obstacle, we just figure out how to move through it. And right now, um, you know, we'll talk about the data here in a little bit, but right now is a very, um, a very challenging time, a very stressful time um, for a lot of us. So uh, we got to just work the problem. So anyway, I appreciate being here and appreciate the support of the foundation, the whole, the whole thing. Well, thank you, Christy and Dr. Dale. Um, Dr. Dale, we'd like to come right back to you right now. Can you, Dr. Hudson talked a little bit about the latest breaking news from President Biden. Um, would you take a moment now and talk a little bit about the current state of COVID both at Swedish and in our community? Yeah, no, thanks, Mona. So um, that's what I thought I'd do is kind of pull back the curtain a little bit and give you all a sense of um, some of the data that we look at and how things are looking um, from our perspective. Uh, the next slide just kind of sets the stage for us. So, um, you know, we've all seen the the stories in newspapers and online. Um, you know, I just kind of snipped these this morning. Um, you know, hospitals halting non non emergency surgeries as as they get taxed with patients uh, from all across the U.S. Um, the the Cowlitz County declares a, an emergency to get a refrigeration um, trailer as COVID overwhelms the morgue. And then the very dramatic news coming out of Idaho um, earlier this week about declaring crisis standards of care, which is a, uh, a technical term. Um, it's a thing that we're, we hope very, very, very much to avoid, but it means that we don't have enough, um, enough uh, space staff or stuff to deliver care and, and we actually have to forego care. Um, and so Washington state is not in crisis standards of care. And in fact, um, when you look at the National Academy of Medicine and, and the kind of the governing documents surrounding crisis standards of care, the purpose of all the planning is to avoid getting there. So it's very bad uh, when, when a municipality or in our case, it would be a state would get to that point. But how are we looking? The next slide shows, uh, shows data and these are all too familiar with, with us. Although I gotta say, sometimes it's like this, I feel like I live in two worlds, like one, you know, when I'm at work and we're talking about, you know, where are we going to open up new ICU beds at First Hill or at Cherry Hill and um, really worrying about like, can we meet this, you know, this need by doing surgery or not? And then a, a different world when I'm out and about in the community. And, and I think that that's a little bit what's made this surge here, as you see the, those cases kind of climbing up there on the right, a, a little bit different is, you know, so many of us would love nothing, nothing more, you know, uh, myself included, than to get back to like our previously planned lives. And yet COVID, I think right now has, has other plans for us. So the next slide shows um, how things are looking in our internal data um, across, uh, across the Providence uh, hospitals across Washington state, kind of centered in the counties actually that Providence serves. And this is um, from our uh, a 
database that we look at kind of pretty much every day or multiple times per day, actually, um, that the, the purpose of, of these different four panels here is to help predict what's going to be coming down the pike. And so I'll, I'll take you through the, um, the data um, kind of going clockwise. So if you look in the upper left there, that, um, that dark gray line, which has, uh, it's maybe hard to see, but it says 24% at the dot, uh, the dot in the upper right hand corner there. That's the per percent of COVID diagnostic tests that come back positive. Um, so it's, it's kind of an interesting measure. It's a, a very good barometer of disease activity in, the, in a community. Um, and you can see it's been going up and to the right, like the numbers are getting higher, which is worse in terms of COVID disease activity. And to give you a sense, like a low number at the kind of low points of the pandemic would be about 4% or something like that. And the high points, you know, we're, we're kind of looking at it like it, uh, there are few places across the nation that have gotten, uh, you know, above, above 25. Uh, and then only for limited periods of time. And that actually correlates with the lower left corner, which is obviously a map of Washington state and the surrounding states. And it shows uh, new cases over the last 14 days per 100,000 um, population. And so a low number here would be in the 100s. Um, sometimes actually we're down into just double digits, you know, like 89 cases in King County. And you can see that like in, in Western Washington, where uh, even in King County, where we are about, you know, three or 400 uh, per, uh, per 100,000, but some of the other counties surrounding us, you see numbers there in the thousands. So very significant disease activity from around Washington state. And a lot of it actually from um, counties outside of, uh, outside of King County, uh, which we'll talk about that in half a sec, but it'll speak, it speaks to Swedish's role as a regional referral center. Uh, in the upper right, we look at um, COVID positive patients who are hospitalized. Um, obviously, hospitalized patients uh, have the most amount of resource utilization, and this takes the dark gray line of actual count and then overlays it with an orange line, which is a forecast. And earlier in the pandemic, um, uh, our co colleagues at Providence, along with the Institute for Disease Modeling, modeled, uh, created a, actually a, a pretty cool model that's relatively accurate to help predict how things are going. And so that you can see it flattening out, which is good news. But the bad news is in the lower right corner there, where you can see the COVID census um, broken down by non-ICU and ICU. And the non-ICU census is flattened, but the intensive care unit census, the ICU census continues to rise. And, and, uh, and that actually is really uh, making it difficult to provide the care that we wanna provide in, in our ICUs. But let's look, at, uh, let's look at outcomes. So if we go to the next slide, um, I have a slide of outcomes from uh, the beginnings of, of the pandemic. So I sliced for about the first four or five months of the pandemic through the end of May of 2020. And I wanna kind of compare and contrast what we're experiencing now versus what we're experiencing um, back then. So we'll start with back then. So first off, I draw your attention to the uh, kind of big red number, this is 130 uh, under expired. And that's the percentage, the number or percentage below 26% of patients that, um, that died uh, as a result of COVID um, initially. And I'd also call your attention to the distribution of, uh, of age groups and then comorbidities. And you'd look at like the number of the percentage there roughly of 60s, 70s, 80 plus, and the number of people with four or more comorbidities. And if we go to the next slide, so freeze that one, you see here that a couple of things have changed. So number one now, uh, the, the percentage uh, mortality, the, the number that expired is down to 6%, um, which is just great, right? That, that represents a significant improvement um, in COVID outcomes over the course of the pandemic. And a lot of that's actually thanks to the foundation, the support of the foundation for helping create the, the ability of, of Swedish to do some of the research that's led to the development of medications that help make COVID better and more survivable. So you can uh, take, take credit for that. Um, it's a good thing. And if you look at the age group and the comorbidities, this also speaks to the effect of the vaccine. So now almost 40% of people are under the age of 50 and there are a lot more people with no comorbidities. And what's this, what this has done is it shifted um, COVID to be a lot of people who only have, um, you know, maybe their lungs damaged, but, uh, but um, are staying on the ventilator for long periods of time. And it's really kind of clogging up the system because people are just taking a very long period of time to recover. And you see in that map of Washington state, um, in the, on the left-hand side there, that we're taking, um, this is home zip code of patients who've been admitted. Um, so you can see that we've taken patients from really, literally, you know, central Puget Sound where we are right now, um, but also all across the state. Um, so Swedish serves the entirety of Washington state. Um, and you can see the, the diverse geography from which we draw. So what does is, what is the future hold? So if you look at the next slide, um, we are forecasting out here with CDC data on COVID cases in Washington, Washington state. And, and it looks like maybe they're plateauing, which would just be a sigh of relief. If this is a, kind of a plateau that we live in for a period of time. You know, we don't know how long or, or um, 
kind of if it's going to go up anymore. There's a lot of uncertainty, but there's there's reason for hope. And the next slide shows that that um, you know I'm a, a fourth generation Washingtonian. Um, my uh, my dad was actually born in Swedish. I was born at Overlake. I'm a I'm a traitor. Um, but uh, but but our Washingtonian colleagues are getting vaccinated and more now than a month ago. And I predict that more in the future than um, than than now, particularly about that new uh, mandate from um, from the president. We're now up to um, 6,900 additional Washingtonians becoming completely vaccinated every day. And when I first pulled the data um, for this slide um, uh, about a month and a half ago, that number was 4,400. So it's, I mean, it's almost close to doubling. And I think that's just great. Like more and more Washingtonians are becoming vaccinated because the next slide shows us um, that vaccines work. So we've been putting this, um, these data on social media um, over the last uh, uh, couple of weeks and you know, hats off to Mona and her team for helping, helping make it. Um, but this represents uh, people who are coming in with COVID to, uh, to Swedish hospitals and each person represents a person with COVID. And then they're uh, white if they um, have not been vaccinated and blue if they have been vaccinated. And you can see that the vast majority of, of people that we're caring for um, uh, just generically in the hospital and specifically in the ICU are people uh, who have not been vaccinated. And, and that's our, you know, our obligation. Our, um, the purpose of Swedish is to serve our communities. Um, but vaccines work and vaccines are the exit strategy. Um, and so I appreciate um, folks on the call um, you know, being active on social media and other places to help, help get, continue to get the word out about that. Um, you know, and we're not trying to judge anybody or you know, separate out Washington and vaccinated, not vaccinated. We'll take care of everyone, but, um, but vaccines are, are part of the exit strategy here. And another part of the exit strategy in, in this last slide here before I turn it back over to Christy um, is, uh, is about the science. And so, as I mentioned before, it's through the generous support of the foundation that we've been able to participate in clinical trials like this one that came out last week in the Lancet um, that, we're, that we um, contributed to um, that looked at actually immunosuppression as a way of continuing to improve the, the or modulate the inflammatory response that happens in COVID associated lung injury. And this one is about baricitinib, which is a new um, novel medicine um, for COVID. It actually has a significant survival advantage. And again, Swedish is one of the participating centers in this uh, international trial. So um, thank you very much for all of your support. Like we wouldn't be able to serve the state and, and advance care uh, if it were for you. So, so thank you. With that, I'll, I'll turn it back over to Christy for some information around how uh, we're trying to navigate patients through this very complicated log jam Tetris maze of uh, hospital operations. So thanks. Christy. Thank you, Dr. Dale. Actually, okay. I'm going to take it over right now. We're oh, going to answer a couple of questions before we uh, roll on over to Christy. So uh, you're always so knowledgeable and informative, and we really appreciate you being on and sharing the big picture of COVID with us. So um, as I said, let's take a moment and answer a couple of questions from the audience first. And again, to everyone on this webinar, please feel free to add more questions to the Q&A section and we'll try and get to them throughout the hour. So the first question is, I'm eligible for my COVID booster in November. I also would like my flu shot. Can I get them at the same time? And if not, what is the time I should wait between the vaccines? Yeah. Um... A long time ago, I was a, I was a flight surgeon in the Navy, and um, part of that is uh, given a lot of immunizations. And so uh, what I was taught then was uh, you can give as, uh, as many immunizations as, uh, as you can find space to give them in. And it, and it turns out that that's true, that it's um, like biologically safe, uh, immunologically effective to combine both flu and COVID. And that's been studied specifically. Um, so yeah, so generally speaking, you, you could, there's some asterisks to that, I suppose, but uh, you can combine immunizations. And so flu and COVID, totally safe uh, to give together. And congratulations for thinking about your booster shot too. I know that's on a lot of the minds of a lot of uh, folks at, the, at this point in time. Perfect. And if say someone decides they don't wanna get with two shots at one time, is there one that they should get first? Oh, that, that's a very interesting question. Um, and it's a hard one to answer because it has to do with the relative risk of uh, flu versus COVID for an individual at a point in time. Um, my guesstimate would be, ooh, I don't know. I don't know if one's better than the other. I'm not going to hazard a guess on that one. It, <laughs> it's probably a noble thing, but it's probably a, a close to a flip of a coin. It's a good question. I like that question. And, and maybe the thought is make sure you get both if possible. Yes, I definitely think that's true. Um, there you go. Um, here's a question. Who is offering the booster? Oh, so the booster. So this, um, I was actually... Uh, curious about this a, a long time ago too. That um, you know, you hear about the the new mRNA technologies like that the Pfizer Moderna vaccines were made from, and the the booster is the same 
the same thing, the same exact vaccine. So they haven't, this is not one that's been genetically re-manipulated, kind of like, you know, how every year we get a flu vaccine and they try and match it to the serotypes of, of circulating flu. The booster shot is the same vaccine that we got before. Um, and so you can go kind of anywhere to get the, the, the booster shot. And it'll be the same, the recommendation is that you still the same type you had before. So I got Pfizer before, so I'll get, for my third one, I'll get Pfizer once the time, once the time is right. But my wife got Moderna and so she'll get Moderna. Um, you know, there's no, you, it is possible to kind of mix and match if you have to do that for, um, for availability reasons or whatever, but, um, but it's generally recommended to stick with the same one. Great, but it doesn't matter really the location, the pharmacy, the, the grocery stores before we're at, wherever, I mean, wherever it's advertised that it's safe and that it's a natural yeah. booster. And we're so fortunate now. I mean, uh, like America has done such a good job of ramping up production that vaccines are very widely available. And so, you know, like Costco, Walgreens, I was driving past a Safeway the other day and I saw a sign like, come get your your COVID shot here. So yeah, any place, um, any place you can get it is, is perfect. Yeah, and we would have never thought that in our lifetime, right? That we would be faced with this. And a follow-up, the last follow-up on this booster is when are we eligible? Yeah, so there's still, uh, we're still waiting. Uh, you know, you'd, I'd heard a date or we'd heard a date of uh, September 20th um, that the Biden administration had announced, uh, maybe that was a month ago by now, uh, for people uh, who uh, would be eligible by timing. Um, and now they've expressed some degree of uncertainty. It sounds like the Biden administration and the FDA are trying to work it out with the CDC in terms of the exact timing. So we're all kind of watching and waiting. Um, and then it'll be based on the timing from your uh, from your last vaccine. And one thing that maybe is worth mentioning is um, the difference between like a third shot, which people who are immuno significantly immuno immunosuppressed on par with having a solid organ transplant um, are eligible for as part of their primary series. Um, so that was a kind of a change that came out about a month ago or so. So and individuals obviously should talk to their own physicians about their, their own health circumstances. Um, but a number of folks are eligible for a third shot, which is different than a booster shot. And I think that was a little bit confusing because the, the words get, you know, third shot versus booster shot gets kind of confusing because it's actually the same you know, medicine, the same immunization that will go into your arm. It's just one has, one's completing a series for immunosuppressed folks and the, and the other one is a booster for people whose, whose time is right. Thank you, Dr. Dale. We appreciate it. And I should mention too, I don't think we mentioned it in your intro that you're also a practicing ICU doc in our hospital system. So we appreciate that. Um, technology, behind the scenes, technology is actually a big part of how we've been able to manage COVID so far. And you heard Dr. Dale refer to it earlier. It's called space, staff, and stuff. That's what we call it. So Christy, we would love for you to elaborate more on the technology we use behind the scenes to help us be prepared for this unprecedented time. Right. Yeah, so happy to talk about this. And I just wanna you know, thank everybody here for the opportunity to share some of this information with you. Um, and I also just have to say, you know, I'm, I'm here actually presenting on behalf of Kevin Brooks, um, our chief operating officer for acute care. And so he sends his regrets of not being able to be here. Um, but again, happy to be here. And um, I think what I'll start off with here is just this image here, which I think really is intended to show you and as we all know that healthcare is a highly complex industry. We know that with insurance companies and government regulation driving so much of this, um, but we also have to acknowledge that we have inefficiencies that are embedded within our health systems that can also add to the high cost of healthcare, the challenges that patients have with accessing care when they need it. And oftentimes hospitals just, they can operate with a fundamental mismatch of the hospital resources um, most often we refer those to those as staff and beds, but it's as Dr. Dale pointed out, space staff, staff and stuff, right? Um, but those are the things that we require and that we need to be able to provide care. And we don't often have those matched to meet the needs of patients when they need it most. So when we don't have the right care resources ready for patients when they need it, it results in waste, which oftentimes is, looks like wasted time that's spent uh, by patients waiting for care, um, but also wasted time of our care teams. And so as we go into the next slide, um, I'll share with you that we often like to refer to this as our, our healthcare log jam. And you may have heard Dr. Dale refer to this earlier. Now, what's interesting about log jams is that they can build up slowly over months or even years. But in some cases, they can also form instantaneously when we have large numbers of trees that are taken down or swept away into rivers or streams, oftentimes after a natural disaster. And so I can say that when we started on our journey to build the stock, our Swedish transfer and operations center, we were intending to solve for a logjam that we saw building over time. 
But with each surge that we experienced in the COVID-19 pandemic, that was like our natural disaster that was threatening a devastating logjam within our health system. So as we go into the next slide, I'd like to share a little bit about the impacts that we've seen in the hospitals as a result of COVID. Um, and I'll break this up a bit. So, um, you know, first I'll start on the left-hand side of this screen here, and I'll, I'll focus on the impacts we've had on our four primary portals of entry, which are our ERs, our hospital transfers or direct admits, surgery, and then of course deliveries. Now, what we've seen coming in through our portals is really just a higher demand of, by patients who are sicker. And this also includes expect, expectant moms uh, who have COVID. And um, we've just seen that, especially with this recent surge with the Delta variant. Now our ER volumes, they did take a hit in 2020, but we are seeing those volumes return and they've been holding steady. And we also know, as you've been hearing in the media outlets that hospitals across the region are overwhelmed. Uh, we see this happening right across the border there in, in Idaho, um, but even having many critical access hospitals in our own state that rely on health systems like Swedish to accept patient transfers when, that they aren't equipped to take care of. And for us to ensure that we have a staffed bed or that we can meet that capacity of those needs of those patients, we do end up canceling non-urgent and emergent surgeries. And then also with increased needs in our labor and delivery units, we've also had to make decisions around delaying elective inductions so that we can care for those expectant moms with COVID. Moving into the middle of the screen here, I'll share that our capacity is constrained, right? That's no surprise. We've been hearing lots about that but it's because we're seeing sicker patients who require longer stays in the hospital. So our turnover of beds is prolonged and we're seeing those beds being taken up by, by a fewer number of patients who just need to stay in the, those beds for a longer time. And as a result, we have caregivers who are exhausted. Um, we've been in this for 18 months and many of those caregivers, they need to use more sick days to find respite. And in some cases, we even have caregivers who are choosing to leave the profession. But needless to say, this further constrains our capacity since we now have fewer caregivers to provide that care to our patients that, that's needed. Now, looking at the right side of the screen, as we're looking at discharges, um, you know, we know our physicians and our caregivers are working extremely hard to get patients home or to their post-acute care setting. But we are finding those resources to be limited as well. With nursing homes and long-term care uh, facilities experiencing the same workforce crisis that we are, their ability to accept patients has also been impacted. And so if that impacts us. So we see more patients in our hospital who no longer meet medical necessity for hospital care than ever before. Now, moving on to the next slide, I think the important thing is to understand is how are we leveraging our stock? And you'll see here, our stock we have is, stands for our Swedish Staffing Transfer and Operations Center. So we have recently incorporated staffing into the operations because we really need to tie in staffing with beds um, and space. So with each surge, what I'll say is that our organization has learned to become more adept in calibrating our clinical operations to meet the demands that, that's coming in through our portals. Um, and our stock has been a keystone in our ability to do this well. And we use data um, through our GE Command Center technology. Now that also has been made available and possible to us through philanthropy. And with all of this information, this data, we're able to make decisions and that allows our stock to help guide us as we are titrating patient flow at our portals. So what you see here is that as, in spite of all of the challenges that I went through in the previous slide, we've still been able to maintain 77% of our normal surgical volumes. And we've been able to keep our boarding hours in our emergency departments that are greater than two hours at less than 40%. And I have to say, if you look at what's happening in the hospitals within our region, their, their boarding hours are much higher, much, much more than ours. We've also minimized our need to delay elective inductions. And for transfers requests that are coming into Swedish, we've been able to accept 86% of those. Now, the stock has also been looking at and starting to support some of the discharge needs as we're looking at the right-hand side of the screen. And so they support nursing units by identifying discharge barriers, which helps us to expedite discharges going home, freeing up those valuable beds. As we look at the next slide, I'd like to share a little bit about some of the data that we look at. And these are the data points. We, we look at so many different data points on a daily basis to help us understand and know how to best calibrate our operations to meet the needs of what, what we see coming into our doors. 
But the data that we have here, as you can see, we have our COVID data that we're looking at. This is an example of COVID data that we have um, and a report that we look at each day to look at our daily volumes, but also to look back and see where have we been. We also look, as you see on the right-hand side here, a screenshot of our GE capacity optimization dashboard. This allows us to closely monitor staff bed capacity. And I have to say, we didn't have this dynamic data at the start of the pandemic. We really relied on manual entry of data by um, our caregivers in the stock twice a day in Excel spreadsheet. And this really only gave us a snapshot of data in time as opposed to live data that we can use to support uh, operations on the hour. Our next slide goes into our ED volumes. And as I had called out earlier, our volumes have really, really remained unchanged over the last three months. But what you see here um, is that despite all of this, we've our stock's ability to support the admit, admit and transfer needs out of our IDs has actually helped us effectively manage our borders. Um, so the graph here, just to orient you to this, what you see are our ED volumes over the last three months. And you can see admits and discharges are marked in the blue and teal at the top. Discharges are in gray, and then any patients that have left without treatment from our ERs are down in the red. And so we have very few numbers of those, which is also a good thing because we want to ensure that we're able to meet the needs of those patients coming into our EDs. Our next slide talk, shows some of the data um, that we look at each day on our ED borders. And so as you can see here, this is actually from yesterday. And uh, what you can see is that yesterday, at the point in time that this was pulled, we had 21 borders across seven emergency departments in our system. So just to put this into context, I mentioned earlier that you know, other hospitals in the region um, have struggled with this. Uh, and so uh, we get reports and we, we stay connected with other ERs um, within the region. And we know we have hospitals that have upwards of 50 or more patients boarding in a single ED. So I think what this is really highlighting here is that with the data that we have, with the operations of the, the stock, we've been able to keep our boarding patients to a minimum. On the next slide, I'd like to share a little data about our inpatient surgeries. So again, with all of this, it's taking all of these bits of information and putting it into a larger picture. And this slide shows our weekly OR cases with completed cases in blue and scheduled cases in orange. And so what you can see here is that about where that yellow star is, is when we started to decrease our inpatient surgeries by delaying uh, non-urgent and emergent cases. When we did that, we were able to drop our inpatient, inpatient cases by about 50%, but we were still able to maintain cases that needed to go in ambulatory areas and also, our, of course, our emergent and urgent cases. But this is what allowed us to uh, maximize our ability to meet the needs of our, our community, both in the surgical arena, but also for those patients requiring care coming in through transfers or our emergency departments. So where do we go from here? So you'll often hear us say, and Kevin Brooks, I'll steal a quote from him. Um, he says that organizations need to learn from the past, operate in the present and predict the future. And I think this, this uh, slide actually presents that pretty well. So we've made a lot of great strides in learning from our past and operating in the present. And we still have a long way to go here, but we have a tremendous opportunity to optimize our flow as we bring on uh, for example, flow coordinators um, to help us with clinical management data to expedite discharges, to help create more capacity, um, to be able to bring in a quality lens into our stock so that we can identify patients at high risk of developing hospital acquired infections, and then proactively working towards preventing that harm that can cause life threatening complications, and of course, also require more time in the hospital. And so, as we use real time monitoring to improve our operations and support our daily clinical operations, um, we do intend to evolve from where we currently are, and we want to leverage the stock to prevent this healthcare logjam and achieve the healthcare flow state, which allows us to serve our mission to prove the health and well being of each person we serve. Thank you. I appreciate the time. Thank you, Christy. Uh, I think that was fascinating to understand really the inner workings of the hospital and how we manage all of this. Here's a question that came in. Um, it asks, how are we being impacted by the surge in Idaho? And will, be will we be taking additional patients? Which is a great question because we also know that uh, patients in the Eastern part of the state are also uh, impacted the hospitals are full. That's a great question. Um, so we have not seen any direct transfer requests coming in from Idaho. Although we do get transfer requests coming in from Eastern Washington. Um, there may be some downstream impact from, from Idaho, as a, Idaho as a result of that, 
But what I would say is, you know, for us, we are always looking ahead. So we are, our goal is always to be proactive in our operations. And so as soon as we get signals from, you know, other states or elsewhere about, um, you know, surges or even the crisis standards um, in Idaho, it was really a signal to us to start thinking about, okay, we need to start planning ahead and start having our um, levers that we can pull to create more ICU capacity. And so while we haven't seen the direct impact yet, and I'm not saying that that's imp we're expecting it to happen, but we are prepared for it should it happen. That's always good to know. Um, and Dr. Dale, a question for you. Can you tell us more about the COVID-19 clinical trials, including the study investigating antibody production in patients who are immunosuppressed? What does this investigation hope to accomplish and what would be the impact on patients living with immune suppressed conditions? Yeah, no, thanks. I appreciate the question because uh, Swedish is really, um, you know, I think we can be proud that we're at the, been at the forefront of the, some of the research from the from the beginning of the trial. And it's really taken a, a bunch of different tacks. Um, I think the three ones maybe to kind of point out are uh, drug trials, oftentimes in partnership with industry about, hey, does this drug work um, for, for COVID? We've done a number of different things like that, uh, including tocilizumab, um, the baricitinib like we just saw. Um, the second one would be some of the more basic science work. And maybe that's the question about the antibody production for people with immunosuppression is that um, both through our solid organ transplant, as well as um, we're advantaged to be um, part of the bigger PROV family through the Institute of Systems Biology, there's been a, um, a fair amount of really interesting work done um, on from a basic science perspective on setting the immune response of the body um, for patients with, uh, with COVID, trying to understand the nature of uh, the body's response to COVID. And then the third one is around uh, what's called health services research, which is kind of using big data sets to help understand the care that people um, provide. And um, I'm a health services researcher, so that one's kind of near and dear to my heart, but it's um, a strength of, uh, again, being part of the big Providence family is that we're able to pull data, lump Swedish data in with other parts of, uh, data from other parts of Providence, and then uh, answer questions around care over time. Um, so yeah, research has really been, an, I think, a, a really cool thing to come out of um, uh, our COVID response. Yeah, even with the first wave over a year ago, I know that research really helped in terms of um, the treatment and approach. Here's another question. Can you give us guidance on the usage of ivermectin for COVID prevention? You know, I, I don't know if a physician has like the training roots in science or not, but I consider myself like basically a, you know, a scientific method person. Um, and so there isn't a scientifically proven use for ivermectin in the treatment of COVID. Um, and a number of professional societies uh, have come out very strongly stating that, um, like S Swedish has come out very strongly stating that. Um, I totally recognize that uh, America is a very large, diverse country and people have very strongly held beliefs about uh, a variety of different topics. But at this point in time, ivermectin is not a therapy that's being prescribed at Swedish. And although I know that a number of patients have engaged uh, physicians over the last weeks or months about it, um, it's not something that we're, um, we're doing. Perfect. Perfectly clear. So another question, what infusions are given if you have COVID? Well, that's actually a, uh, an opportunity to talk about something that's really kind of cool. So um, the monoclonal antibody therapies are something that actually for, uh, for outpatients are very helpful in preventing hospitalization. Um, it's been a bit tricky for us as like, uh, you know, the society to figure out the right place to give um, those antibody infusions. Um, but I really got to give a big shout out to the folks, um, both of the um, crisis response clinics, or excuse me, universal, universal response clinics um, at, uh, at the Swedish uh, Center for Comprehensive Care, as well as our colleagues at the Ballard Emergency Room, um, because we've been able to navigate um, it's dozens of people a day now there for, uh, for infusions, people who qualify. So the general, generally speaking, the inclusion criteria are people who have uh, kind of new COVID and then um, significant uh, comorbidities or, or risk of worsening. Um, and then they're navigated to Ballard via the Universal Response Clinic um, and then get an ambulatory infusion that um, takes about 20 minutes or so, though there's a period of observation afterwards. Um, so that's been really um, a really cool thing um, that's come onto the um, kind of the market over the last, you know, several months or half year now, maybe it's been. Uh, and then if you're an inpatient, obviously you have other infusions that, that you get. Um, probably the most effective one is actually just steroids. Um, Decadron is the one that was studied the most, but it's a class effect. So any steroid it would be fine. Um, and then other anti-inflammatories too. Um, so sometimes there are other 
uh, other medications that you get. Oh, and remdesivir, I should mention remdesivir is IV as well, and so antivirals. So a whole different panoply, depending upon who you are and where you are and kind of the, the you know, your own individual circumstances. So check with your doctor. Check with also. your doctor. Always good advice. It should be a standard. <laughs> standard. Exactly. Um, and again, please, this is your opportunity. We have experts on the line. Please chat in your questions. Uh, keep them coming. So here's one that says, um, what does this mean for me if I need to bring my family member into the emergency department? I think of misunderstanding how full we are. I can take this one. And Dr. Dale, please feel free to chime in. Um, so I, here's what I would say. Um, I think if you actually look at the data and, and you look at the, the graphs that I shared with you, um, you can see that um, we, we've been prepared and ready to take care of the volumes that we've been seeing coming into our emergency departments. Does it, does it not mean that um, you know, EDRs are, are overwhelmed or are feeling full? Um, certainly they are. And I think that's you know, what we're seeing right now is because you know, we have a, a higher number of COVID patients coming into our emergency departments. But that all being said, if you actually look at our data, we've been able to really process our um, patients coming in through our emergency departments, get them placed and assigned to beds. Uh, though I would say that we're, you know, maybe not perform not um, getting patients placed as quickly as maybe we had outside of a surge. But given the fact that we are in a surge and where we've been able to accomplish this, um, I actually am quite proud of our ability to be able to do this and the operations of our stock and the ability for our stock to help support our campuses and getting patients placed as quickly as possible. Um, and I'll also just add that, you know, these, these are things that we look at. We look at these, these numbers of patients that are um, coming into our ERs every single day. Um, and anytime we know we're running into a, a bit of a, a hurdle, um, this is where we have our leadership team come together and really rally around it. And Dr. Dale uh, mentioned teamwork and working the problem um, earlier in the beginning of the presentation, and that is exactly what we do. So we do that even down to the level of patients that uh, might be uh, not have a bed assigned, and uh, we work together to find a bed. And I think that's the great part of the team that we have and working together as a system. Perfect. Here's another one while we're on stock. Patients with cardiovascular disease have a complicated journey to navigate throughout the healthcare system. Will stock be able to help with this? Yes. Um, so let me, I, this one is a great question as well. And I think this is where I think we have a tremendous amount of opportunity as we look at the future of the stock and where we can go with this. And um, so to, the short answer to that question is yes, 100%. Um, you know, especially as we have um, cardiovascular patients who are coming into the health healthcare system who are requiring, you know, an acute care um, stay within one of our hospitals. Um, what the stock does is they work together with the providers, they work with our case management team and our nurses um, and ensure that we're, we're placing patients in the right place, right? That they're getting to the right bed, they're getting to the right care team um, and that they're um, able to receive care under the direction and the care of the provider who's accepted them. So that, that is an absolute um, yes to that question. And I will also just say, I think the integration, how we start to work across the continuum of care is that opportunity that we have. And that's what we look forward to as we start to innovate in the stock and then just across our system. Perfect. Um, also, there's a question, we'll stay on stock. This one says, I'm thinking about the staff morale that Dr. Hudson mentioned. Does this new technology help your caregivers? Yeah, so, you know, technology is kind of funny because, you know, you think technology will be get introduced and it just makes everybody's lives easier, but there are also times where, you know, you have to look at the workflows that are attached with the technology. But here's what I'm going to say about this is that, you know, when we think about the stock and, um, you know, one of the things is we start innovating and where our future is, is really looking at how do we leverage our data so that we can have predictive analytics so that we can actually start projecting what is going to be coming in through our doors. So we can project the, the demand for the beds um, and that allows us then to be proactive in how we're scheduling and planning our resources. The satisfaction that that brings to our caregivers is that they're, when they're assigned to work, they're assigned to work and they're going to be working at the, the highest level of their, their licensure. Um, you know, it reduces the, the chances of them having to you know, provide care in a care environment that perhaps they may not be as comfortable with because their home environment doesn't need them because they didn't plan correctly for the volume. So it just allows us to better align our staffing against what the, the patient care needs are. 
And that actually reduces a lot of um, redundancies in the workflows of our caregivers as well. Okay, and we have a couple questions here on vaccines for younger uh, children and adults. So do you have any idea when vaccines will be available to children under 12? Yeah, I can take one. Um, the short answer is not exactly. Um, that originally it was looking like, uh, and Pfizer will probably be the first one out of the gate. Originally, there was some discussion that Pfizer might be able to have complete data by the end of this month, by the end of September. Um, but then the FDA uh, asked both Moderna and Pfizer for additional data on, uh, so they could uh, additional data on additional patients, so they could uh, collect uh, data on more rare things, uh, particularly cardiovascular side effects or potential cardiovascular side effects. So now, the reports say, you know, maybe my November timeframe for Pfizer, and it's looking like probably after the first year for Moderna, um, for for twelve and under. Um, so that's a kind of a setback because uh, the vaccine, like you know, there's a giant chunk of our population that's uh, not currently vaccine eligible. And um, I know a lot of, as a parent, uh, I'd love, we got two kids uh, who currently can't be vaccinated. So I'm counting the days as well to try and uh, get uh, get our kids vaccinated. So I think we're all very, very eager. And I actually was just uh, looking before this call um, over the stuff that President Biden just released. And in there was uh, all resources necessary to expedite uh, FDA evaluation of vac vaccines for people under 12. And so I know it's a, a top priority for the federal government as well. So we'll have to wait and see. Yes. And here's one that says, my granddaughter has the vaccination, but her major concern was infertility. Has the FDA made a big difference? And is there any scientific information that concludes that infertility is not affected or fertility, I think is what they mean, is not affected? Yeah. And, and that one's one, I think, to, you know, like all the questions about individual people and stuff, operate with a lot of compassion because um, issues surrounding fertility and pregnancy can be very difficult for, um, for a lot of women. And you understand, I mean, it's very understandable why um, people wouldn't want to, you know, do vaccine, take vaccines or do things that might harm themselves or decrease the, their likelihood of being able to conceive. Um, but there, there isn't scientific evidence that that's the case. Um, you know, I'm not sure how that kind of got started exactly, but um, a number of different professional societies have come out with, again, very strong statements, including actually the, you know, the CDC as well, um, with very strong st statements, um, you know, indicating there isn't a link between the vaccines and infertility. It's sort of in the, in my mind, kind of the urban legend sort of um, category and that people should, should feel very safe taking the vaccine. Uh, similarly, and this one's been in popular press as well, is um, for pregnant women that um, that's, uh, you know, I think a lot of times people are hesitant to take, you know, medications or, or have vaccines if they're pregnant. And again, like very, very understandably so, because you don't want to do anything that might harm um, um, the fetus or your baby. And, um, and this is a case, though, where you've seen the effects of not not getting vaccinated that, you know, one point in time, two weeks ago, we had uh, three pregnant women in our ICUs at First Hill. And um, like as an ICU doc, like I really do not like the intersection of pregnancy in the ICU. Um, and um, and Pregnancy, because of the physiologic stresses, is a, is a vulnerable time for women and, and for their, obviously for their babies too. And so um, it's very important that, uh, that pregnant women um, get vaccinated. It's a particularly vulnerable population. I really appreciate um, like Tanya Sorensen and others here at Swedish being very vocal on that um, publicly in NPR and Q13 and other places and, and the professional societies coming out very strongly out of the gates um, going back more than a year now uh, on that, so. Okay, perfect. Um... What is your take on additional variants and potential future variants of COVID-19? Boy, we'd get a lot of money if we could figure this one out. Will higher vaccination rates continue to be the top priority in the exit strategy? Oh, the second part. Yeah, 100%. Like, that is the exit strategy. That's a sustainable thing that, you know, we've talked about this, I was going to say mythical, but it's not mythical, this notion of herd immunity, that if enough people are, are immunized, that the, it, the, it makes it much, much more difficult for the virus to, um, to replicate and to, and to um, circulate in a population. Um, and, and we desperately, I mean, obviously, uh, you know, People know this, but we, we desperately need that to happen, right? Like the stuff that's going on right now in Northern Idaho and even here in Washington state where people aren't able to get the surgeries that they need because of the amount of circulating virus, it's just, it's terrible. And vaccination is the way out. And yeah, I mean, I think that most uh, like virologists or experts in the field think that we're gonna end up here, probably something semi akin to, uh, to the flu where there will be 
uh, regular booster shots or booster shots at regular intervals, probably with um, different serotypes or compositions over time as the, the virus kind of does what viruses do and, and mutate and stuff. And so you know, I think we just, there's a lot we don't know. And I think one step at a time, and these booster shots, as I mentioned before, aren't you know different than the shots that we got the first go round. Um, but again, like both Pfizer, Moderna and, and other ones actually too, or, or other companies are working on the ones to follow on, which might be a little bit different. And, you know, you kind of watch in the, the news about things like mu or, you know, Delta now, but um, mu or other things coming up in the future. So we're definitely keeping a close eye on it, but probably more shots to come and vaccines are the way out. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Someone once said an analogy about like jumping off a cliff. COVID, the first wave was like jumping off a cliff and now we're, we jumped off another cliff with the variant. And it just seems like we're learning, we're all learning a little bit more flexibility, right? In our lives and how to live in this new world. Um, another question, what resources are in place for caregivers experiencing compassion fatigue, burnout, and even post-traumatic stress as a result of the pandemic? I'll take this question. Um, this is uh, just such, I, I'm so glad to hear that our attendees are actually thinking about this. This is on my mind every single day. Um, but, you know, I, I think I, what we have to offer, and I'm actually really proud of we, we have a lot of different resources um, to offer our caregivers. I think one of the things that we do have is, you know, of course, we have our caregiver assistance program, which is through Lear Health. And, and that actually, I, I'm impressed to see kind of the variety and menu of options that are available to our caregivers, because it really allows them to tailor, you know, what resources they need access to based on what they're experiencing. Um, of course, the pandemic and everybody's, um, you know, how we've been um, kind of had to operate and, and work in this pandemic has been a huge contributing factor to that. But burnout in healthcare is not a new thing. Um, I think uh, it's certainly gotten exacerbated over the last year and a half. But other things that we do and that we've continued to do uh, is, you know, offer wellness retreats. Um, you know, we have uh, philanthropy uh, that has helped us to be able to put some of these on where we are able to send caregivers uh, to wellness retreats where they can do a little bit more um, focused work personally for themselves and also be able to do that kind of away uh, from work. And then also trauma workshops. Um, I know there was a mention of what are we doing to address some of the post-traumatic stress? Um, and, you know, we offer, uh, you know, specially curated trauma workshops for those caregivers to help them process through that. Okay. And here's a couple more last couple that we have on boosters. Will my Swedish primary care provider reach out to me when it's time to get my booster shot? And will I be able to receive the booster from my primary care provider? And finally, also in boosters, once you get the booster shot, how long does it last? Thank you, Karen. Um, So in terms of the first question, like once you're due, will your PCP, uh, Swedish PBC, PCP reach out to you? The answer will be yes, eventually, um, though, the longer kind of technical answer is that the the automated recall systems are based on the recommendations from the uh, the CDC, and it takes time for those to kind of be filtered through and to program the logic into the computer. Um, this is what happened in the first go round with COVID, but eventually, yeah, it'll be the the need for vaccine will become apparent in in Epic or in in my chart. And then, um, can you go to a Swedish PCP to get one? Um, a solid maybe on that. Um, we've uh, looked at various points in time over the pandemic around the best way to get the most people vaccinated. And that's why we kind of doubled down on stuff with Lumen and with other things. And now there's very widespread vaccine availability in the community. And so we'll have to see about um, how much incremental benefit there is to continue to offer at, at Swedish primary care locations. We recognize that people really like to get it there though. Um, and then was, oh, last one was, well, I still, how, how long will it last? Um, uh, I think that one's a little bit hard to say. Um, you know, like we're seeing waning of the, the immune response um, from the original shot on the order of, you know, a certain kind of single digit, small single digit percentage per month. And we'd expect that booster shots would have a similar sort of decay in efficacy. Um, and at the same time, kind of like that uh, figure I showed that, um, that Mona and team created, it's been on social, the, the, the shots are still extremely, extremely, extremely effective in preventing severe illness. And so we'd expect that that would continue as well. So yeah, I think those are great questions. Thank you, uh, Christy and Dr. Dale. We're going to pause now and I'd like to bring in and introduce Tracy Ostrom, who is our president and chief development officer at the Swedish Foundation. 
Thank you, Mona. Uh, it's a delight to be here today. This is my first virtual event uh, with Swedish in my new role as president of the foundation. I think today's program is, you know, it's a powerful reminder of why we all support Swedish and why I'm so delighted to be here in this role to work with, you know, this, the largest nonprofit healthcare organization in the state. The role of philanthropy, you know, it's powerful, it's Swedish. And I have to say, I was just um, so pleased throughout the program to hear the reinforcements on the role that philanthropy plays at Swedish. You know, we heard it today related to stock and the margin of excellence that it's allowing us to do as we think about the hospital of the future. We heard it um, referred to in the research activities that we're able to support through COVID. And I know that we're working with Christy on how we can help our workforce and our, our nursing colleagues um, navigate their future. And I would just say, you know, as we enter the giving season for Swedish and we all think about our year end giving, that we take a moment and think about healthcare as a priority and also healthcare as a priority for our philanthropy. Um, I'm constantly reminded that Swedish saves lives and Swedish makes lives better. And so as we think about your end giving and, and the impact that we want to make in our community and our state, you know, I hope you'll prioritize Swedish within your philanthropy. And, you know, for those that are contributors with us here today, thank you so much for what you've done for Swedish. And, you know, I look forward to seeing all of you in some virtual in-person future um, in the near horizon. Thank you, Mona. Thank you, Tracy and Dr. Hudson and our panelists, Dr. Dale and Christy. And really our thanks to all of you, as Tracy said, for taking the time to tune in. As generous supporters, um, we absolutely rely on your partnership and we hope this time was well spent and that you learned a lot. If you didn't get enough of Dr. Dale and Christy, uh, I think I neglected to say I'm the chief communication officer at Swedish and we put on Facebook lives so look us up on Facebook live they are often there hosting and talking about different topics and bringing our experts to the table so anyway we've enjoyed this time with you and thanks again for joining us if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to the foundation. Thanks so much and have a great rest of the day. <laughs>